question. Um, so, uh, oh, wow. And Nitcha is on immediately. That's how it works. That's, you know, that's how we roll. We go really fast. Hey, Nitcha. Can you hear me now? Definitely. Uh, it really works, the the, the off-mute button. Um, <laughs> hey, so before we get started, before I, I, I even introduce you, I want to talk about uh, the raffle real, real quick, because people only have one more hour to register. Uh, and if you register, you uh, are eligible to play in the raffle and you can win a beautiful swag bag, uh, which, you know, what's not to like. Um, so it's <laughs> still for an hour until the top of the hour um, or 9 p.m. CET uh, in, in my case, uh, you can still register and, uh, you know, uh, participate and maybe win a swag pack. So that's, that's fun. Uh, but now uh, without further ado, because I want to, I want to uh, give all the time we possibly can, uh, to Nietzsche, uh, to talk about sketchnoting and how to communicate and retain ideas better and also embrace all of your creative skills as well. Um, so Nietzsche, uh, you're a, or you have a PhD in computer engineering with 20 plus years of software research and development experience spanning distributed and ubiquitous computing and mobile and web uh, application development. Uh, you're currently a cloud advocate in the Microsoft Developer Relations team where you spend your time on mobile and cross-platform development for Azure and Microsoft Surface Duo. So that was a mouthful. I was just, I have a duo, so I'm like, yes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So like a real quick demo, and then you know, like people can imagine what it looks like. Um, uh, yeah, no, this one the, I'm, I have to unbox this one. I just got the unlocked version of it. So they sent me one with the. Um, if I can, I'll, I'll show you the original first version of it. The first generation one is charged. You go there. If it's charged, I'll show that. But uh, I might do one better and show you the docs, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> no, I mean. I, we haven't done unboxing on this stream yet, so totally welcome to. Uh, but uh, but otherwise, let's uh, get uh, straight to your session. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so let me see. First of all, is everyone able to see my slides? Awesome. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Nithya Narasimhan. Um, as Flora mentioned, I'm based in New York uh, in the US. I have a PhD in computer engineering. I actually spent my whole kind of like dissertation on Java way before, so long ago that RMI was just coming out. And I've used it maybe a couple of times in my career. And I think that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm here to talk about things like this, because technology moves so, so, so fast that we constantly have to kind of keep figuring out ways to learn new things, share what we learn with others and really engage with a bigger community, right? Like we want to connect people and make technology feel accessible. So this is kind of what the talk is about. So before I get started, like the little uh, kind of graphic that you see on the left side with all the colors, colorful flowers is something I did. Now that's something we kind of think of as doodling, right? So hopefully all of you are the kind of people who, when you have a minute to spare and you've got like a sheet of paper next to you, you actually doodle. You kind of like randomly make marks on the paper, right? And to many folks, that is literally, you know, it's not considered productive. By the end of this talk, I hope I change your mind. Because one of the things that I got involved with visual storytelling and sketch noting and all of this stuff is that the idea of our creative side kind of being put to the fore is so we learn how to focus, we learn how to improve the way we understand things, and we can actually remember them longer, better. So my today I want to talk to you about my journey from self-care to storytelling. Who am I? Um, this is actually inspired by Keith Haring's street art, if you've ever seen it. Uh, and these are kind of all the facets of my identity. I'm a senior cloud advocate on the mobile advocacy team at Microsoft. And that means that I kind of look at how we can engage with the mobile de developer ecosystem at large. But I'm also generally interested in kind of figuring out ways to make the cloud, multi-cloud strategies and concepts accessible. But part of that is we all have these different facets to our identity. So if I have to stop and think about where we are today, like this is you know, International Women's Day, what does it mean? To me, it's really always about just two things, right? The content we create, which is where I kind of look at stories and the people that we connect with. I've said this many, many times, right? You can go through different technologies, you can go to different companies. The two things you will always take with you are the relationships you build and the kind of reputation that you create, right? And so when you think about something like this, sketch noting, I want you to think of it in two aspects, 
content that every story you write is actually kind of useful information in its own right. And then people, who are you telling the story to? So the other thing in here is there is, of course, a message, which is we belong here. I think this is something that as women, as underrepresented minorities in tech, as whatever kind of areas you feel not included in, this is something you really need to tell yourself and believe, right? We belong here. We have a right to be here. And that's kind of one of the messages that I hope this also sent you. So let's talk about visual storytelling. Um, at the end of this talk, I'll actually share this uh, image. This is what I kind of look at as a sketch note. But it's also a summary of this entire talk that I'm giving today, right? So we're going to talk about four things. What is visual storytelling? Why should you and me care? How can we get started? And then finally leave you with some resources for how you can perhaps do more on your own. So why visual storytelling? To me, it's really about a very, very simple fact. We all have to learn continuously in the, in the ecosystem we are in today. And it turns out we all process information differently, right? So if you are one of those folks who learns best by buying textbooks or reading blogs, you might be a read-write learner. If you are a person who learns best by kind of doing hands-on tutorials, you might be a kinesthetic learner. If you actually can absorb information by listening to lectures or watching videos, you might be an auditory learner. Most of us are actually combinations of all these. But the interesting fact here is two out of three, two out of three of us have a visual learning ability. And what that means is that we actually can process spatial and visual information very quickly. We immediately, the minute we see a picture, subconsciously we're absorbing cues in the picture. We're making connections to things we've seen before. And we're kind of like, you know, very subconsciously kind of telling our brain, here are some things that are interesting to us and that then helps us make connections to things we already know. So as humans, our brains are wired for this. And if we don't address visual learning, we're not addressing 65% of our audience. So we want to go where the learners are. And that's kind of what started me down the path of how can I use visual storytelling for tech? But my journey in visual storytelling started way before. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that because um, this is actually something I'm sure all of us deal with, but we don't talk about. And that is, if you have ever felt burnt out, if you've ever been on the verge of like being frustrated or you've kind of just had these issues where you're like, oh my God, I just don't feel good enough. Why am I here? All those words that we hear, right? Imposter syndrome, all of that stuff. I went through it many, many times. The very first time that I started doing kind of what I think of as doodling and sketch noting and all the stuff, I was actually doing it for self-care. It turned out that in all my kind of roles, I've always had to do a lot of public speaking. I've always had to be in front of an audience. And it gave me incredible anxiety, incredible anxiety. At the same time, I kind of needed a place where I could step back and really introspect on what was happening, right? Self-care to me was about finding a way to anchor myself in the present, to kind of block out the noise, don't get anxious in crowds, and also pay attention, like really understand what I am doing at any given point in time. So I started drawing as a way of anchoring myself, right? So this is really like, you know, I was at a conference and I was drawing the, the, the kind of bowl of flowers on the table. And that, that visual actually became the representation of what I wanted to do. I wanted to always be present. Fast forward a few years and then I started using this for journaling. Like everywhere I go, I would have like this little notepad in my hand and a pen. That's all it was and sketch everything. So the little picture you see in the middle, that's actually my son. Um, he was really mad at me. And rather than like kind of, you know, sit and talk to him, I was busy sketching, I was capturing the moment. Because what turned out is that the more I sketched, the more I remembered details. And I wanted to remember that moment where he was so mad at me, but not mad enough that he wouldn't ask me what I was drawing, right? And I still remember this moment. And then when I joined uh, the cloud advocacy team kind of like two years ago, I chose to announce it with another sketch because it turned out that we'd, when we tell our stories visually, people stop and pay attention. And this kind of that visual tells you everything you need to know about me, what my background is. I live in New York. I was joining advocacy, et cetera. Fast forward. And then this is where really the tech storytelling story begins, because what happened is I started using this as a way to go capture notes and conferences. And I'll talk a little bit about that in more detail. But when you step back, I want, to, I want you to think about visual storytelling as a roadmap with three parts. First is just note taking. Start taking notes visually, like take down quickly, doodle, draw figures, et cetera. And that is really what we're going to focus on today. 
sketch noting 101. But once you've conquered that, the, the kind of you know um, intuitive way to grow that skill is to go to something called anthropomorphism, where you start adding characters that kind of have eyes and ears, because it turns out that we emotionally connect to faces and characters, right? So you can start adding these characters into your story to give people a sense of what is happening to that particular technology. And last but not least, the most powerful thing, in my opinion, is metaphors. You can teach anyone anything if you can connect it to an idea they already know and then use analogies to build on that. And people will actually kind of grok the idea, start building their own analogies and get to understand it faster that way. So with that in mind, let's kind of get started at where, like in Microsoft, like what am I doing with all of this stuff in Microsoft? My journey in visual storytelling has started a year ago. I was actually doing, a, just like I'm doing now, I did a session at Build on how to do visual storytelling. And I was incredibly surprised by the fact that a lot of people really resonated with it. So when the, when the talk was done, there were like people sketching out stuff that they're, in fact, you're more than welcome to pick up a pen and paper right now and just doodle what you hear, take notes and share it after the fact. And that's literally what they did, right? They were, and it was illuminating for two reasons. One, when people write their own visual notes, you understand exactly what they took away from your talk or message. You might go in there saying you want to teach something, but when they write it down, you know what they actually took away. So it was really very illuminating for me. But the other thing is it kind of led to the series of things we did that helped actually bring this a little bit more from, hey, let me do this to let me show you how you can do it. So one of the resources which I'll share at the end is the Visualize It uh, series of workshops we did recently, just finished in February. All of the videos are online. It's like two hour workshops every Saturday done by community experts, which will take you everything like from learning how to journal to kind of learning how to use Procreate to building your own graphic recording kind of mindset and so on. But if you kind of think of visual storytelling as just communicating messages, there's also this other benefit. And that's what I want to talk about on the right side of this picture. Up top, this was at Build. Satya was giving a keynote and I sketch noted and shared it. Lo and behold, he liked it. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm done, right? Satya likes this sketch note. Good. Achievement unlocked, I can go home now. It got better because people from his team came and said, hey, is there something you could do to help us with visualizing this down the line for other talks? And I'm like, oh, this could be interesting. The same way Charlotte, who's one of our uh, CVPs, her team came and said, can you actually visualize her story when she talks to other people? She can use this as a way to describe her own journey. So it became a valuable asset to do personal branding, right? So think about this as a, a kind of storyline. You can use this for self-care. You can use this for journaling your own life. You can use this to teach people about concepts that they don't understand by giving them something visual to look at. Or you can help amplify your own kind of presence by doing things like building visual stories for other people. So having said all this, what is sketchnoting? This is me sketchnoting at the Create Startups conference like two years ago. And if you kind of see the background of this, that is what my sketch noting skills look like then. So first thing I want to take away is anyone can sketch. It's not about drawing. You don't have to be an artist. It's about being able to capture your unique perspective and put it down on paper. That's all it is. It isn't perfect, but it's mine, and that makes it unique. So what is sketch noting? It's really rapid note taking. You want to build up speed. As soon as the person talks, you want to have captured what they're saying and put it down there. Second, it has to be visual. How can you translate like, you know, what could have been 10 minutes of words into a single tiny image that captures that very succinctly? Because remember, they can speak for 45 minutes and you have just one sheet of paper. Last but not least, and this is where our value really comes in. It's about how well you can summarize and synthesize what they talked about. And this is where your ability to have a broad base for knowledge is important. If you can, if you're an artist, you can bring in your analogy to something that you heard from the art world and represent it. And now you've created a version of that talk that is unique to you. If you hear someone, let's say, talk about a data factory and you're someone who has actually worked in an automotive context, right? You can make analogies to that and bring your background into it. And that makes yours unique. But when you've kind of got through those three phases, so in the next phase, in the next kind of part of this talk, I'm going to go through what you can actually do to like do these three steps. But as I mentioned before, once you've got sketch noting done, 
you want to go into connecting people, connecting with them visually through these kind of characters, explaining metaphorically using analogies, and then visualizing consistently using vocabularies. So those are the three aspects of a toolkit for visual storytelling. First, note taking, then build on top of that with anthropomorphism, metaphors, and vocabularies. And I want to give you a very simple example of what I mean by a metaphor. If you see the example here, you might be wondering, why did I draw a truck, right? It turned out that I was actually building a sketch note that explained cloud computing. And I'm like, OK, what is cloud computing? And someone said, it's the delivery of computing services over the internet. And I'm like, really? That's it. We are going to describe this whole kind of area of cloud computing using delivery trucks. And there's literally a sketch note for that. And I'll show that to you later. But now, once you've got this mechanism in your mind that delivery is, is the word I'm going to anchor to, I can start explaining other concepts like scaling using trucks. Oh, vertical scaling? That's like adding more tractor trailers to your truck, right? Horizontal scaling? That's buying more trucks, right? So there are really interesting ways for you to take metaphors and explain stuff. So let's get started now. And if you are interested in kind of playing along, grab a pen and paper. I'll give you a couple of minutes. And what we're going to go do now is walk through some of the basics of a toolkit that will help you create your own sketch notes. So for each one of these things that we'll talk about, you just have to like, you know, play with it. Get a pen and paper, doodle away, write a few things, and then practice, practice, practice. You ready? All right. First, the first, first, first thing you want to do is actually get into the mindset of stretching your sketching muscles. Just like with everything else, right? If you don't use a muscle, it atrophies. Same way we are all born with creative instincts. We are. When we're toddlers, when we're in elementary school, we are like so bold. We're like, we'll we'll bring home all the art, tell all our relatives to stick it on their fridge because we are like, wait, we are geniuses, right? Something happens to us past the age of like eight or nine. We start thinking we're not creative anymore. We become very serious and logical. But the creativity is still in there. You just need to stretch that muscle. How do you do it? So I want to see if I can play this again. But this is a trick that's uh, kind of talked about in that book called The Doodle Revolution. Every morning, take up a couple of minutes, get a pen, and just like draw. But don't take your hand off the paper. Start with drawing a single line that just goes all over the paper, crisscrossing itself multiple different places. Then spend a few minutes creating textures and hatching or coloring in the intersections. Just spend five minutes every morning doing that. It does two things for you. It gets you into the habit of loosening up those sketching muscles. But more importantly, if you do this in the morning, I will guarantee you that you will wake up with your mind kind of really happy. Like you will be able to think clearly. It's like you, you kind of clear the cobwebs and now you're ready to do something else. I also want to point you to this book and it's called The Doodle Revolution. I actually have a copy here. And what it is, is a book from this person called Sunny Brown, who did a TED talk on this topic, where she talks about the importance of doodling, goes into a lot of the theory and the value behind it. And her one thing that, she, like the takeaway for me, is that the way you look at doodling is doodling helps you think. Without, your, without even knowing it, it helps you clarify what you're thinking about. It helps you focus. And inadvertently, it reveals to your subconscious brain what you are actually focused on, what the problem could be. Doodling might actually help you fix some of the problems that you're kind of thinking of right now in other contexts. But start by stretching your doodling muscles. Once you do that, we're going to walk through these components of what I call a visual storytelling toolkit. Fonts, quotes, people, icons, containers, layouts, direction, and colors. So what you're seeing there that's kind of animating is an example of a digital sketch note. I only digitized it so you could see how I drew it out. You can do this on pen and paper. In fact, I have pen and paper sketch notes all over the place in my room. We're going to walk through these, but really quickly. Fonts refer to the way you write stuff down. Quotes are those kind of meaningful phrases that stand out. So in here, there's a find your voice. People is really about representing individuals, uh, a group of people, or postures. You can see that there's a little community icon in there. Um, icons are for other things, too, any kind of symbol that is immediately relatable, right? So the minute I draw a megaphone, even without me telling you what that's about, you know that I'm saying something out loud. Containers are, for example, a little cloud that contains all the information. They're a great way for you to scope things. Layouts, direction, and colors help us actually lay it out in a way that it makes sense to people which things belong together and how they should read the sketch note. 
So we're going to start with this. So if you've got your pen and paper ready, this is a good time for you to get started. Toolkit item number one, fonts. Learn to write. At the end of the day, when you're sketch noting, it's really about note taking. And if your handwriting can be read, that sketch note is useless, right? You don't have to have beautiful handwriting. It just has to be legible. So there are two things we'll talk about here. First, font sizes for hierarchy. So when you write a lot of information, you might have seen it in, in, in different sketch notes, and I'll, I'll show you examples later. But it's just like with a web page. You use font sizes to, to, to kind of draw the user's attention to what are the big items, and then what's a lot of supplementary information. The second thing is font types. Know at least two or three different types for two reasons. First, they give visual interest, right? Your eyes immediately drawn to the triple block, for example, right? But the second thing is by using those, you can create a consistent vocabulary where after a period of time, people recognize that anything like say in bubble font is going to be a quote, could be, right? So the two examples that I've given here are for, you know, like just simple font, single, double, triple, and then kind of types of fonts, cursive, block, et cetera. The two books here are the ones I've used. I found them super valuable. Um, lettering and alphabets and artwork is really nice because it kind of gives you the entire alphabet, A to Z, and numbers 1 to Z, 10, I think, 1 to 0, whatever, uh, or 0 to 9, I should say, in various kinds of visually appealing fonts that you can draw. So if you just practice those, you'll soon have a really rich set of like visual vocabulary for fonts. Next, quotes. Quotes are meaningful because what you're really looking for is to kind of draw the reader's or uh, viewer's attention to the takeaway message of whatever it is you're capturing. So if you're capturing a talk, listen for the one thing that the person says again and again and again. That's your quote. If you're reading a document or a tutorial that you're trying to summarize, look for that one phrase that shows up multiple times where it kind of becomes the anchor. Use that and surface it. This is one of my favorites. This is from Austin Cleon Steel, like an artist book. And if I had to remember one thing from that book, it was that quote. It was like, practice productive procrastination. As a lifelong procrastinator, that to me was like, like, I, like it was shattering, right? I was like, yes, this is me. I'm a productive procrastinator and I have to practice being a productive procrastinator. I loved it. So look for that quote that has emotional resonance to you. People, once you've got those two, remember at the core, sketch noting is about text. Once you've got the ability to like write stuff so people can read it, and you've been able to use your ability to listen for resonant quotes and surface them in a different font, now you're really looking for all the other visual cues that you can add. So the first is people. Adding like little stick figures doing stuff tends to do two things. One, it adds visual interest. But two, especially when you're trying to explain it to someone, you get this kind of almost intuitive ability to get them to feel like they are there. So if you draw a little character that's thinking, what do I do now? People will resonate. They'll be like, oh, yes, that is exactly the question I had at that point. So how do you get started with using figures? Turns out it's actually not too difficult. Learn to do two things. First, learn to draw an individual. So if you look at the little person one, it's literally like a little blob with a little ball on top and two sticks, right? That's a person. If you can draw that, you're good. In fact, if you look at a lot of my sketch notes after, you'll see there are tons of those. Second is learn to draw a group. To draw a group of people, there are various ways you can do it. There's tooth people where you just kind of like do like a fence and draw lots of little dots. Or you can do what I do, which is draw lots of those little persons. And then as you kind of fade into the background, you just put dots and it looks like there's a whole crowd. That's pretty much what you need for the core. Ability to show that what you're talking about relates to one person, or it relates to a community. Once you've got those, then practice poses and faces. The easiest way for you to do that is make a cheat sheet. There are tons of them. Pinterest is your friend. And what poses do is allow you to add kind of whimsy, but also be indicative of things that might be relevant to what you're describing there. So if you just, if, if you're, the thing that you're doing solved a problem, you can have a celebratory figure. If the thing that you're doing required someone to type in stuff, you can have someone sitting at a computer. There are cheat sheets where you can literally copy down and keep these next to you. So it's really quick and easy for you to copy over those postures. Icons, this is super useful for you to create a cheat sheet ahead of time for the domain that you work in. As an example, I do a lot of work in mobile and web. 
So I have a cheat sheet that has like things like uh, a mobile phone. It shows the Wi-Fi signals. It could show computers. It could show the hotspot. It could show placeholders, all of those kinds of things. My resource to go, uh, your, my go-to resource for this is the Noun Project. So Noun Project is a really nice site where there are designers who built icons, which are non-traditional. They're not like your regular icons that you see. They're like icons that portray the messaging in like interesting ways. And you can go there and learn from them how to visualize ideas you wouldn't have otherwise. So here are a bunch of icons. These are the normal ones. So if you feel up to it, pick one of these, draw them. Or look at your phone and just try to draw some of the, the kind of like the icons for the various things that you see on web pages, et cetera. Once you've got your icon cheat sheet, now you have the basic vocabulary. You know how to write, you know how to draw, you have icons and people, right? Now you really need to think about composition. How do you make this information fit on a sheet of paper in such a way that people can make sense of what you've written? Containers are your friend. So what containers do is really they help you do two things. They group ideas together. So by drawing a container around 10 different blobs of text and figures that you've written, just draw a container around it. You're saying these are all related in one way. The other thing it can do is also create boundaries from things that don't belong together. By drawing a container on this and a container on that, you have kind of intuitively separated the two and say this says something and this says something else. What I like to do is pick something in a container that actually is whimsical. Like, yeah, you can always just draw squares, right? Sure, you could do that. What's the fun in that? So try doing different things like stars. Exploding stars are great. Banners are fun. I like the signposts. You might even come up with your own thing. But containers are really there to group things that belong together in one place. Layouts, on the other hand, are really about understanding how you kind of like write or lay out the information so it fits on a sheet of paper, but also intuitively gives the user a sense of how to navigate it. So it turns out that like if for me, when I'm taking notes in say a, a talk that I've never been to before, I tend to go radial. So I'll start, you know, I'll kind of go from the outside and keep coming in towards the center because I have no idea how long this person's gonna talk. The closer I get to the center, the tinier my font will get because I'm like, I have no space. If they leave me too much space and they have nothing more to say, I'll just make the takeaway message really large. If they still keep talking, it's gonna keep getting smaller until I run out of space and then I give up, right? But jokes aside, the, the way you represent information intuitively tells the person who's looking at it one more thing. A great example is hub and spoke. If you're gonna visualize one of those talks which says here are 10 things you need to know about Power Apps, right? Hub and spoke is great. You literally say 10 things I need to know about Power Apps. Put 10 different kind of popcorn things coming out. And now you just wait for that person to talk about each of those, summarize it within its container and you're done. So layouts is a great way for you to make things flow. And you have to think about how much information you have to capture. Directionality, on the other hand, is how you connect the layout and make sure people are following the flow. Uh, for me, this is really like if you are if you kind of go hiking or if you've been, if you're one of those people who loves maps and navigation, this is a really interesting place to like reinvent stuff, right? So you can put um, kind of like trail markers, you can just use simple arrows, anything you like. But what you're really trying to do is give people a sense of flow and remember that in certain cultures, it's going to be left to right and others right to left. So having that arrow gives them an intuitive sense of how they should be following the information on the page. And finally, colors. Once you've done all this, the reason I always put colors last is most of my stuff, my raw notes are always in black and white. It's just pen and paper. But if you can, and if you have the utility and the time, colors are a great way to add this additional level of information. First, they create visual separations, right? So in this, for example, you can automatically see that the background is kind of this greenish thing that immediately creates these islands of all the things in there. Second is they create contextual connection between things that are the same color. So if you see four rectangles all in dark blue, even without reading them, you know they're somehow connected because they're the same color and they kind of are looking very similar. So color should come last. Uh, one thing I will say is the biggest challenge that I'm facing right now that I'm trying to work on is accessibility. When you pick colors, you know, think about the fact that there are folks who are colorblind. How do you make this accessible to them? And in general, this is visual. This is highly visual. How do I make this accessible? And so I'm kind of exploring ideas like creating audio tracks, putting transcripts, of course, all text for sure. So there are other things that we can do around this. So 
hopefully I think I have a little bit more time. Yep. So when you look at this, right, all of this, we were talking about what are the different ways and I'll come and take questions and talk as much as you want, but I want to give you a quick sense of what you can actually do with this. First, this is actually my process for capturing what I call high res sketch notes. And I'm going to show you a few examples and point you to a site that you can look at. And what high res sketch notes are, are things that distill an entire volume of information into one page. So here, what you're seeing is actually me distilling what's called, um, in Microsoft, we have these learn modules. There are multiple units. This is an entire course from Carnegie Mellon on elasticity. It has like four to five modules. It takes you a lot of time to complete. So if you look on the right side, um, that's it took me four pages of visual notes, right? Left side shows you those kind of zoom in on any one of those pages. And that's what I kind of had to deal with. The iPad in the center shows you what that looks like when I distill that whole thing, all four pages down into one high risk sketch note. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. That is what that looks like, right? So immediately, if you get a chance to look at this image, you might be able to pay attention and find a few things that we talked about. There are banners, there are icons, there are font sizes and shapes and hierarchies that help you quickly understand what's important, what are takeaway messages, et cetera. There are little icons with people in them that explain stories in a way that you'll resonate with. But most importantly, this is my use case number one. What are sketch notes useful for? Sketch notes are useful when you want to give someone a visual recap. Like, here's the big picture of something you're going to dive into. Take a look at it and then dive in. So this was used with a Learn Live uh, session, right? Learn Live is where um, a couple of ad an advocate here, Jay, um, worked with a, a student ambassador, and they kind of like over an hour went methodically through this training, right? This tutorial. This one picture summarized the whole thing. And what it does is our brains are wired so that if I were to look at this picture once, even if I'm not paying attention, my brain is actually picking up keywords. It's picking up linkages. And now when I go into the actual module, it kind of looks familiar, right? I don't struggle as much because I've seen how the big things connect to each other. Now I can dive into the details. The other thing this can also help you do from a study perspective, if you sketch, if you do visual notes for your own studies is, Later on, when you have to do things like take a certification exam, this actually becomes a really good summary of everything that you learn. You can look at it and be like, do I remember all this? If not, where is my gap, right? And it's a single page. You can scan the whole thing in minutes. Most importantly, try, try it for yourself. In my case, I will tell you what's on every one of these in every single corner because for some reason, my brain snapshots these things. I can't remember all the text, but I can remember the pictures. The second thing you can do is this is capturing live. So if you look at it on the top, that's what it looks like when I capture live. Like here is a, a this is a VE, uh, VP, this is Arunula. He was doing a keynote for one of our data conferences and I was capturing it live and it looks really ugly, right? Here's the value of it. You can go back later and refactor it. Refactor means you can clean it up, make it look pretty and then put out the final version. You can create another version of it, et cetera. But what you do with this is two things, right? First is you've got your own takeaway message from that conference. Second is it becomes a really useful asset for you to give to someone else. So in this case, Arun was like, oh my God, this captures exactly what I was talking about. Now think of where we are now. We are all online. All our conferences are online. Everything is online. So if you have something to say, or if you want to connect to someone, how do you cut through all that noise? Visuals will do it for you. When this goes out in a stream of textual tweets, People pay attention. They stay until it's done, right? So think of it as a way to actually not just capture what you heard, but do the kind of networking that you would do in real life that you can't anymore. It's a great way to connect to people. Um, the other thing you can do is you can also capture from recordings. Because we're all online, more and more people are pre-recording the videos and then kind of like going out there, playing the video, but then doing interactive Q&A. So volunteer your time to go and you know, sketch note the recordings ahead of time, then post the sketch note during the conference when it's live, when the when the recording is being played. It's a great way for people to kind of kind of anchor themselves around that conversation. And it gives you, you know, a much cleaner sketch note. This looks much nicer than the other one, right? So share it at the live event. You could do this for your own talks. I kid you not. I do this all the time. You know what you're going to talk about, make the sketch note, and then schedule it on Twitter to like fly just as you are hitting your kind of final slide. And people will be like, how did she do that, right? 
but it gives you the ability to put a takeaway summary of something that's live, but you actually had time to prepare for it. Um, and then I kind of, oh, this was the play by play. This is uh, for people who are new to public speaking. I do this all the time. In the middle, you're seeing kind of like the notes that I took to create what's called um, a dual screen talk. So the dual screen talk is about um, the Surface Duo. There's a ton of stuff that I had to get through. So I literally mined the entire dual screen doc so I could figure out what exactly are they talking about? What is the scope of what we have so far? Then distilled it down to the slides you see on the right. Bonus, and this is just, this is this is not, this is kind of funny, but it's also true. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, hopefully you can, but um, wait, do you still see my screen? I hope so. All right, so let me step back. That thing that you're seeing there, um, let me actually go back to the slide itself. Oh, did it, has it frozen? Okay. Give me a sec. Okay, I think we're good now. So what you're seeing there, I actually summarized in one sketch note and then I printed it and it's this. I don't know if you can see it. This is the size of a regular TV screen. And it's literally the entire sketch note of the docs. You're effectively printing the docs, right? But it turned out that this kind of stuff is, it, it sounds funny, but it's actually interesting ways for you to make people engage with technology in ways they would not otherwise think about. For sure, now I have people who know what's in the docs for dual screen, simply by virtue of the fact there are so many ways for you to present it to them. Um, and then I want to talk about two last things, and then I think we'll see if there's time for questions and wrap up. Um, this thing is called a zine. If you've never built one, it's really about doing the same thing that you're doing all this time, right? Like all the sketch noting tips and tricks, except instead of making a single sheet, think of your sheet having eight cells and build your content around the eight cells. And what happens is you can actually just fold those. It's a, it, you, you don't even need extra materials. You just like make a small tear, fold it up and you get yourself a little eight page comic or an eight page zine. And it's a really good way for you to give away your own talks takeaway message, right? Why allow other people to try to like capture something? If you give away what's effectively the takeaway message and you decided to do it the way you wanted to do it, not only are you giving something to someone that they can take away to remember you by, but you're giving them the last word on it in a way that you want to explain. Plus it's fun. Uh, so earlier on, I'd actually put this there, but if you ever wanted to try, you know, your first, your hand at sketch noting, try a zine. It's just eight cells. You only have to put one thing per cell. You don't have to write this much and you have something to give away. I know this because I've got both a 12 year old and a five year old to do this on their own. So you can do it. Um, and last but not least, when I started this talk, I actually showed you this. This is a sketch note of this talk. And on the left, you're seeing it being kind of drawn out because I did it on uh, my iPad and I can actually capture the recording and replay it. And I always show this for two reasons. One, now you have the takeaway message. Everything you heard today is summarized in there and you don't have to take notes. You can just go print that out. Uh, I'll actually have a link to a high-res version of it. But on the left side, you're literally seeing how I put it together, right? So you get to understand how did my flow work? Where did I make mistakes? Where did I go back and change things? How did I deal with like, you know, balancing of how much space I had with how much content I had to fill, et cetera. So the, the, the kind of, um, in case you missed it, at sketch the docs is the account. Hugely advocate you follow it. That is a, it's a one-way account, meaning that I follow no one and I will not ever like chat on it. It's no spam. Every tweet in there will be a high-res sketch note with a link to some place where you can learn more about the technology being sketch noted. And that's it, right? So there's no like spam or anything. Uh, if you want to kind of look at it, each one of those sketch notes is like 4K. So you can put it on a TV and you should still be able to see it. But it's a great place for you to go learn as well. Like, hey, this is how, here are some ideas I can take away for how I could do mine. If you want to learn step by step how to do a lot of this, uh, the resource I want to point out is dev.2 slash t slash visualize it. So visualize IT it stands for both. So visualize it or visualize information technology. There are six workshops, videos, and resources. So you can go through it step by step. And on the right is cloud-skills.dev. Every sketch note I do these days goes in there. And they're really high resolution 
So if you want to kind of, as I mentioned before, play around with ideas, go check it out. And then um, I'm going to leave this up for a couple of seconds while I look at questions. Um, what is the thing that you're um, trying to do, right? Like here are the resources I recommend you look at. Left, Austin Cleon's books. If you just want to understand how can you tap into your creative cells and why is it important, it has nothing to do with sketch noting, but it has to do with creativity and why it's important. Go look at that whole series. I think they're even available in most libraries. If you're starting a sketch noting uh, journey, Mike Rohde's books, the ones in the middle on the sketch noting workbook, is the book that almost all of us have started with. Next to that is things like um, hand drawn maps and visual doing. These are books that are useful when you kind of want to deep dive into one aspect. So hand drawn maps is so amazing. If you want to understand how to make those old fashioned maps, you know, the little dragons and the compass roses and all that. But it makes you realize how incredibly difficult it is to represent a lot of rich information and how they were able to do it by using iconography, right? Visual doing is a great way if you're going to work on business or fusion teams because it talks about how you can work collaboratively to kind of do brainstorming, mind mapping, all that kind of stuff. The last three are actually blogs from very famous folks, or not famous, I would say very well-known folks in this space. Everlotta Lamb, fantastic blog for everything sketch noting in terms of how to do kind of postures, how to get started doing like the, your first visual, et cetera. Denise Yu for anthropomorphism, she has a whole bunch of one page sketch notes that show you how to take characters and explain things like Kubernetes. Um, and then Maggie Appleton, who really taught me a lot about how to use visual metaphors. And I think that was the last thing. So all of them are in here if you want to just snapshot the resources. And so thank you so much for listening. Ideally, when I do this in a workshop format, I encourage you to like, you know, use hashtag think visual, do some sketch note and share it with me. I don't know if we have time for that. I think we're at time, but if there are questions, let me look at it. Um, I see the, uh, if anyone has questions I didn't see, let me know, but I'm seeing, uh, or wait, let me just ask. Flora. I'm gonna just, yeah, I'm gonna just okay. quickly show my sketch note and then just take it away really quickly oh, as well. Like, it, it's not fair. That would be awesome. Um, I did, I, I did really try. Oh my gosh, I'm on big screen now, so I have to really share it. Uh, I feel, I feel really bad for like almost five years of art school, and this is what I produce. But you know, I really, I, I really like uh, uh, practicing. Uh, and someone or our moderator in the chat asked, actually asked, who is sketching this uh, sketch note talk, which uh, is kind of meta, and reminded me of our speaker. Um, uh, you know, speaker I briefing. That. that is awesome. I just still have it. So we had a speaker briefing uh, for for our viewers, um, and uh, then I asked Nitya if she could maybe <laughs> maybe sketch note the speaker briefing, which she did uh, because she's awesome. Um, so that was that was super useful as well. Um, I, you mentioned doing uh, sketch notes for your for your own uh, talks and then sharing them immediately after. If you have recordings of talks doing the sketch notes uh, sort of at your own pace and then being able to share those out. Uh, I, I also have, uh, have examples of a couple of conferences that do sketch notes as a sort of a speaker gift so that, you know, the speakers have something to sort of show for like, hey, I didn't only do this talk and it's maybe recorded somewhere, but also, you know, like people actually watched it and it took something away from it, which is really, really nice. I, think. I should shout out Minds Eye CCF. In fact, one of the six workshops in Visualize IT is from her, that's Ashton Rodenizer. She does what's called graphic recording. That's the person who stands on the stage. I'm like doing just a sheet of paper. She does this on this giant roll, wow, right? Wow, that is even, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah. is very cool. Yeah, so, so if you could share that link in the chat later on, I think that would be hugely helpful or even the private chat here on StreamYard and we'll make sure that it hits the arena chat on the website as well. Uh, yes. Let me see. Uh, I have a question of uh, someone asking if sketchnoting is a little bit like mind mapping in a way, but then with uh, sketches? Yes and no. So mind mapping, I, I kind of like to think about visual storytelling as an umbrella where you have different things you can put in there, sketchnoting being one, mind mapping being another. The intent is different with mind mapping. You're really trying to organize information, right? So you're using your own vocabulary. Mind mapping has its own vocabulary, right? So it's like there's whiteboarding, there's mind mapping. You're trying to organize information. What is the intent behind that? You're trying to find things that relate to each other, et cetera. But you aren't trying to make it overtly visual. You're not going to spend incredible amounts of time thinking of metaphors for mind mapping or right. trying to come up with iconography. The thing I want you to make, mind mapping is a, is a tool and a technique you could use. But I want you to think about it that 
for the rest of your life, anytime someone comes and sees one of your sketch notes, they should be able to say, this is Nithya, right? Like yeah. without even looking, can you do that with a mind map? You can. So mind mapping is one more tool. In the I bring a lot of personality to my mind. Map, so then you're, then you're adding elements of it. But to, my, to the, the bigger point is the, the intent. What is your intent with mind maps is you usually want to organize information to solve a problem or to help people collaborate, right? Yeah, with sketchnoting, with any of the stuff, you're like, I want to visually capture stuff in one picture and I want to have a vocabulary. If I had to like hang my hat on one thing, it's like vocabulary. I want to create a vocabulary for my whatever I'm working on. Absolutely, that's a, that's a wonderful answer. Thank you. Um, what uh, uh, maybe one more question? What will you be focusing on next in on improving on in your sketch notes? Okay, I mean, so I already think it is hugely difficult to you know make sure that you use all of the paper, but also not too much. Like that, that seems like that would be my biggest challenge probably. Uh, I actually am going a, a slightly different direction. So first of all, you know, in my journey itself, I want to go down from a form, metaphors, all that stuff, and just practice, practice will improve me there. But I am now hell bent. Oh, excuse me, on because uh, my if my son hears me, I'll have to pay money. So I am actually interested in what I can do to rethink accessibility. So the problem is, this is so beautiful and visual, and everyone loves it, and I'm getting all the marketing folks love it. People who want to understand this, they'll love it for takeaway. All that is great. But why did I do this? I want people to learn. I want them to be able to see it. So how do we make it accessible? So we're actually playing with some ideas of having a SoundCloud <laughs> where I can put this up and I'm literally describing the whole sketch note in a SoundCloud. That's one. The other thing is if you're in HTML, there are image maps, area maps you can do. So what are ways in which we can kind of create sensitive areas on a sketch note? that you can interact with, like you click on one part of a sketch note and it actually reads out what's behind it, could be another way. Like, how do we make it accessible? I think that was the path I want to go towards. Like, this is pretty, and now we've proven that like there are many uses for it. I still get like Dapper was just released and people are so thrilled, like, yeah, we can see it, we understand it. But <laughs> what about the people who couldn't see it? Yeah. What about the people who phone color is a problem? So I think that's kind of where I'm at. I'm, I want to see how we can reinvent that. And of course, uh, I'm not kidding. I just made a sketch note for someone that I respect greatly. And then I made it. I kind of had it printed into a lampshade that she's going to get very soon. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, you know, anything you can do with a photo, you can do with this. Yeah. So I think there's this, we need more fun in tech for the love of God. We need more. <laughs> we need that's more an, I think that's a, it's another coin in the swear jar, uh, but I don't want to. <laughs> no. And I'm like, it, it, you should have seen like this. This really made my day, right? Um, and there were things like the we did a green tech uh, sketch note, and it turned out I could make it into a tote bag. I can literally wear green technology into the grocery store, right? So I, I, I just feel funny. like what we're doing is trying to make it fun to learn and try to make it easy for you to understand and connect things. And that's pretty much it. We're like so smart. Documentation is the gateway for everyone to learn technology. And yet we are so inundated with text and like, how do you kind of just make it easy for people to, you know, have fun with it. And also from my personal journey perspective, um, maybe it's an age thing. I don't know. I find that I have to write things down to remember them. It could be, there are many people who have that, right? Like I, I cannot remember stuff until I write it down. And once I write it down, I don't ever have to look at the sheet again. There's like sheets of paper that I've never touched, but I have to write it down. And so that literally my journey was because I write things down. And then people were like, hey, you have nice handwriting. Why don't you share it? I'm like, sure, here, right? Um, but that was my thing. It's like, how do I teach myself and remember things? And then how do I make this fun for other people to learn? Yeah, I, and, and I love that. I think that's the, the best sort of summary that we can also have for this, this track as well is practice your creative muscle and have fun. Uh, and that's why <laughs> that's why I wanted to do this. So I've, I, I feel I, like we've come full circle. You know, we're gonna, I, I actually saw your knitting session. Do you remember Charles Dickens and Madame Lafarge and she knits code into the, into yep. the thing? We need to knit a sketch note. <laughs> <laughs> 100% that's so going. That's going to be the FTW Conf uh, 2022. I already made too many promises for next year's edition. I should stop. I should stop talking, um, which I actually will. Um, so thank you again, Nitya, for your session. Uh, thank you, Stacy, for your session. 
this was a ton of fun. I'm so happy that you know they allowed they <laughs> allowed me to do this track. Um, and now all of you have to you all have to go to the main track uh, where we'll have the closing notes. Uh, so we've had our little closing notes here. We'll have closing notes in the in the main track and instructions on what the party will look like. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining uh, this uh, loony bit uh, track. I had a lot of fun, and I hope you had as well.